try this again. Friends, we welcome you in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we come together in person and online, we give thanks for the tie that binds us all together, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, in your bulletin, there are a number of announcements. We're going to highlight a few in a moment. But if you're going to tune in and tune out to announcements, I encourage you to listen to these because these are the most important announcements. We're reminded that no matter who we are, no matter where we've come from, every single human being on the face of the earth, we believe that Jesus invites them all to this table of amazing grace. Miss Skyler, you want to come over and share with us about our identity in Jesus before the Lord. We are the baptized children of God. Coming Saturday, April 13th, from 8.30 to 11.30 a.m., we're going to have a spring clean here at the church. So you are welcome to come during those hours. There will be different jobs and jobs for everyone from um, for our little kids um, up to adults. Uh, so please come join in. Jim is coordinating that um, if you want more information. Next Sunday... We're offering communion training, and I think serving communion is one of the most holy and precious things that we can do. Our elders and deacons do that, but our book of order allows others who are authorized by the session 
who have had training to serve communion. So if you're interested in learning the theology of and the mechanics of communion here at Covenant, we would love to add you to the roster. We'll do that after worship next Sunday in the Van Light Room. Okay, we all know VBS is coming. And that is such an exciting time. And we also need lots of helpers. Um, and Covenant is so great at supplying help and people um, and love and adults to walk alongside of our kids during that week. Um, but we are just kind of going to be doing an interest meeting next week, giving you the overall picture of what VBS is going to look like and where you might fall um, into volunteering that week. So that will be directly after the service next Sunday. Excellent. Coming up, we have some excellent adult education opportunities for you uh, on, I think it's April 21st after service. Uh, Ms. Coralie Bachman will be here. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she's going to be giving some guidance on how do we build appropriate boundaries in our life? How do we say yes, and then how do we say no? And is Coralie here? She's not here today. Uh, she has a lifetime of experience as a therapist. We would love to invite you just to learn some helpful boundaries. And then the following week, April 28th, Dr. Lois Ortman will be giving a session after worship about gardens in the Bible and how we can learn from them. Excellent adult ed, we invite you to those. Mark your calendars, kiddos and families. Um, April 27th, our very own Jason Byers, a member at Covenant, is going to be putting on a magic show for, um, for us as well as the community. Um, this place was packed last year, and we just want to encourage you to invite friends. It's a free event um, and just a lot of fun for the whole family. So um, that'll be April 27th at 3 p.m. Next week, we're going to have some friends from Luther Heights Bible Camp here ready to share the excitement and the joy of what it means to go to camp. So for all the big kids out here, this is what the session has asked us to do. We want to make sure that summer camp is affordable for all of our families. A full week of camp, 460 bucks. Multiply that by two, a family is looking at almost $1,000. Our session doesn't want our families to make financial decisions and choices. Uh, so they're asking you to help out. Whether you have $10 or $460, these special dollars will be going to invest in the children here in this room. So we'll be doing a fundraiser this week and next week. And it would be just fun to say, families, because everyone else has your back. If you'd like to make a special donation, uh, you can do that in special envelopes or on a check or online. Just be sure the memo says summer camp. Whew, we have lots of announcements today. Another very special and important one is about the ministry of our deacons. I want to invite Jocelyn Newell to come forward. She is the moderator of the deacons. And as she comes forward, I want to say thank you to three special deacons. Um, Ms. Lori Banner, Ms. Sandy Davis, and Rich Wells, who were here yesterday providing a beautiful funeral service uh, and fellowship for Ms. Jean Bond. And these flowers on the communion table are in memory of her. And our deacons make that happen. Ms. Jocelyn. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope you've had a wonderful week so far. Or actually, now we're going to start a new week. Um, Sandy and I are up here just to share a little bit about are, what we do, um, and really what I'm trying to convey to you today is that we are here to support you as well as our community. We're all very well um, informed about what we do to serve our community outside of the church, in the schools, and with the food pantry, but we have services that we want to make sure you're aware of, especially if you're at home watching and you need a ride. Um, please let us know if you need uh, a ride to church and hey if you can volunteer to give a ride we'd love to have your name on the list to support that ministry so if you'll look inside your bulletin and you'll see a little sheet of paper here yeah. oh thank you thank you um you'll see a list of things that you may not know that we're doing um and candy will talk a little bit more about the new ministries but like i said we we do give a ride <coughs> Um, but sometimes we need volunteers outside of the deacons. Um, and I wanted to just let 
you know, like, we are amongst you. We are not above you or to the side of you. We are with you. Um, and if I could just have the deacons who are here today stand up for just a moment, um, because I feel like you don't know we are with you, and we appreciate it knowing that you know who we are. So if you have a deacon need, if you need a prayer, um, if you need anything, if you have a family member that would like to do communion, thank you guys for standing. Um, and that's not everyone, but, and we also have a lot of deacons who um, used to, or used to be deacons, and now they provide serving, they serve communion with us, and you can be a part of that, as Kevin just said. So please come join us on the serving communion training. We could definitely use the support, and it is a, a wonderful way to feel God in your heart. Personally, that's how I feel. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we have on that list? Um, so for the blood drive, if you select the blood drive, just know that we, it's a quarterly blood drive, and sometimes we just need people to provide snacks. Sometimes we just need people to show up for a couple of hours to help check in people. If that sounds like something that you want to learn more about, just put your name on here and check that off. If you um, want to help organize the pantry, keep it clean, keep it supplied, our deacons do oversee that and they're super involved. But I thought I'll put it on the list because I don't know if you guys knew that we do that. And also, some of the things in that pantry have been there for a while and some things need replenishing. And it just might help to have a small group that can support that continuously. Um, and Sandy, do you want to tell us a little bit about the meal? And After a few years of taking off our meal ministry, we just started again. Um, when you check meal ministry, you will share the information um, that if you, if a need comes in from one of our members, um, an email will be sent to you. You can sign up for the day of your choice. Um, uh, and it's really just so simple, but just so special to our members in, in um, with an illness or with just a family need that having a few meals, are, it's really a blessing. Um, mission, we currently have five servant teams serving the Boise Rescue Mission at River of Life Men's Shelter, and we have the opportunity to serve at City Light Women's Shelter. So if you would like more information about serving, um, we're serving meals, just we're, there, we're part of the family, just um, it takes two hours um, a visit and a beautiful, it's, we are so appreciative. Um, so just check any box, all the boxes, you'll be contacted and just to give you more information of the ministries that we do. Um, and then put in the offering plate. Yes, exactly, I wanted to make sure we, I'm like, oh, what do you do with these once you fill them out? Um, you can leave them on your seat, you can put them in the offering, or you can um, just bring them to the Connection Center. Um, but we do, um, we just wanted to share what we're doing and we thank you for your time today. Joshua, As we come together for worship, let us pray. God of glory, fill your church with the power that flows from Jesus' resurrection. That in the midst of this sinful and dark world, that it may signal the beginning of a renewed humanity, risen to new life with Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, let us stand together, together as we sing our opening hymn.
Bible tells us that if we say that we are without sin, that the only person that we're deceiving is ourself. And the Bible also says that if we confess our sins, our brokenness, our dependence upon God, that God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in a spirit of humility, I invite you to join with me in the unison prayer of confession found on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Friends, the good news of the gospel of Jesus is that getting Jesus, getting God, has nothing to do with what you do. Our reconciliation with God comes only through what Jesus did for us on the cross. Friends, God's love for you was so much that God became one of us, teaching us the ways of the kingdom. And when the good news of love was threatening to the empire, the principalities and the powers who executed our Lord Jesus on a cross, God's love for you and the person sitting next to you was so much that overcoming the power of hell, overcoming the power of death, Christ rose in victory to show me, you, and all of creation that if we would just put our trust in him, did you hear me? Not yourselves, if we'd put our trust in him, we can be certain that the path to eternal and abundant life lie close at hand. Amen? Amen? Amen. Friends, as the forgiven people of God, we are called to be the forgiving people of God. So I invite you to greet your neighbor with a peace sign, handshake, hug, whatever you're most comfortable with. And simply share, may the peace of the Lord be with you. So great to see all of you today. This week in Sunday school, we have we're going to learn about another miracle that Jesus did while he was alive on earth. And so I have a question to start off. 
How many of you guys, or can you share with me your favorite things that are either packed in your lunch or that you get to eat at school from school lunch? Laurel? Cookies. Cookies, that's good. Pizza and cookies. Pizza and cookies, school lunch. How about Cheese stuffed breadsticks. Mmm, oh, you guys are making me hungry. Uh, Sophia, last one. Sandwiches. Sandwiches, yes, excellent. Well, have you ever thought that your lunch might do amazing things? <laughs> That's kind of a silly question, huh? What kind of lunch does amazing things? Well, in the Bible, in every gospel, there is a story where Jesus feeds more than 5,000 people. The story is called the feeding of the 5,000, but what we know is that there were probably maybe double, maybe triple that amount. And guess what they fed the 5,000 people with? It was a little boy's lunch. He came forward and Jesus looked out in the crowd of all of these people. And Jesus said, oh, these people are hungry. They have been listening to me teach all day because his lessons and what he was teaching on were so exciting. People stayed all day to listen, but they didn't pack enough food. They didn't know they were gonna be there all day. And so Jesus looked out and said, these people are hungry. What are we gonna do? And do you know, Jesus let a little boy be part of the miracle. And the little boy says, well, I've got, I've got some fish and some bread that my mom packed for lunch. And Jesus says, that's going to work. And Jesus multiplies this and feeds the whole crowd. And you know what? Everyone's bellies were full and there was extra food. But I think it's so cool that Jesus let a little boy be part of of the miracle because he loves children so much and you know what jesus didn't just do miracles in the bible he does miracles today and in our lives and i wanted to share with you a quick story because it was a story shared with my from my sister-in-law this week about a miracle i think it was a miracle that happened and it was a boy that got to take part in it in her life <coughs> My sister-in-law, Nancy, her brother is about 50 years old and was working in his, they were, she and his son were working in their attic and they were on a really tall ladder. And the dad, her brother, climbed up on the ladder and the ladder fell. At least 20 feet, the ladder fell. And the boy, his son, was a teenager, was stuck in the attic and couldn't get to his dad. And his sister, or his, the, the, the man that fell, his daughter found him, and he didn't have a pulse. But she started to do CPR, and you know what the boy, his son did? His name was Porter. He was up in the attic, and he started praying. And he prayed the whole time. His dad was down on the ground and the ambulance had to come and they had to take him to the hospital. And this little this boy, he got to pray for his dad the whole time. And do you know, they weren't sure if he was going to live. But the next morning, he woke up and he's alive. And I think God performed a miracle that day on my sister-in-law's Nancy's brother and we're so thankful and we're thankful for the prayers of his son right so I encourage you even though you're young and little your prayers can make God do miracles and he listens and he hears our prayers so let's go and find out more about this story about feeding the 5,000 today and we have a new song a new exit song so it's called pass the promise Steve are you going to introduce it yes okay I will. So let me sing it for you once and then we'll sing it together. <laughs>
Today's scripture reading is from the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It can be found on the overhead screen or on page 152 in the Old Testament of the Pew Bibles. Let us pray. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the Israelites. No one came out, and no one went in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have handed Jericho over to you, along with its king and soldiers. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days with seven priests bearing seven trumps of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. So Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and have seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Friends, I'm not preaching today. Some of you are like, oh, thank God. (laughs) What I love most about this congregation is that at our best, um, we're a family and we love one another. Uh, So normally, a senior pastor will introduce our guest preacher for the day. But in the spirit of familyhood and shared leadership, uh, there's someone who knows our guest pastor a little better than I. So my friend, my sister in Christ, Meg, would you be willing to introduce our guest preacher? Uh, It would be an honor. I, um, my dad is going to be preaching today, Tom Greco, and he mentioned that he might share a slightly incriminating story (laughs) about my adolescence. So I just wanted to clear things up. I was a nearly perfect teenager. Um, No, but my dad, um, after serving 24 years in active duty in the U.S. Army, he retired um, from the Army. And I think in his mind, time started over in the civilian world because since then, he has held many roles and many positions Um, And he keeps on saying yes to things uh, in life that are presented before him. Um, Most recently, he retired as head pastor from Ontario Community Church in Oregon, 
Um, and he's serving uh, the state of Idaho as the um, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army um, and also continues just to serve in Sunday school here and um, in just his neighbors. And he, my dad is a friend to all. Um, he is a prolific gift giver. Um, he loves his grandkids and his children. He is married to my mom, Gail, and they've been uh, married for 47 years, loving our family and serving the Lord together, which has just been an honor um, to be a part of and to witness. Um, so, Dad, we're so excited to hear your story. You are um, a hero in our family, and I know to so many, so we're grateful for you. <laughs> well, good morning. And before I begin, Meg, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'll give you some cash later on. <laughs> and uh, you all know Meg. She's been the family pest. She is so wonderful. But you know, did you know that she's so devious? And so is her mom sitting over here. <laughs> and somehow they colluded and conspired with Pastor Kevin for an April Fool's prank for me this past Monday. You see, Meg and Gail got together and they convinced Pastor Kevin that he should send me an email that tells me that I got to go through all these denominational hoops before I come to speak here to this this morning. And so Kevin wrote this note to me, and you know, I just talked to him in the morning. And so I said, why, you know, why didn't he tell me this in the morning rather than waiting till later in the afternoon? But he sent me this note, and he told me basically that they, he was concerned that I might be, or he insinuated that I might be an unrepentant felon. So I had to get a letter from my bishop that said I was in good standing. Then he also told me that I had to go through a three-hour Zoom meeting on Presbyterian theology and polity, so I made sure everything was just right. Then he also told me that I had to be here at 8 o'clock in the morning so that the elders of the church could meet with me. And they would question and do an inquisition of me for, <laughs> for probably about an hour and a half. And at 9.30, they would give me thumbs up or, nope, you're not talking. <laughs> so I wrote them a note back, said, Kevin, tell me that this, this is an April Fool's joke initiated by my daughter. <laughs> about two or three hours later, I guess the sin <laughs> finally convinced him that he needed to forgive. <laughs> and he wrote this, and I quote, Tom, I understand the bishop's letter has already been, been delivered. <laughs> Excellent. It was not 30 minutes after our phone call when you shared about your gratitude to the Almighty for the two most beautiful women in your life that your daughter, yes, your family pastor, approached me with this idea. And when the idea was affirmed and blessed by Gail, <laughs> I just couldn't say no. <laughs> Any and all retribution should be directed towards the women. <laughs> and I humbly recognize that that guy named Adam tried the same thing, <laughs> but it didn't work out too well for him. This is your pastor. <laughs> Today I want to talk about storms in our lives, and I, I selected a Bible verse that many of you probably know. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 8, and I'll just put it up on the screen. You can find it in your Bibles or on your phones, or just read from the screen. It's a short message that talks about Jesus calms the storm. Matthew 8, verse 23. 
And then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. And without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. The word of the Lord. My wife's an artist, a very talented, gifted artist, an award-winning artist. I have about maybe a half a bone in my body, maybe, art-related. But she's taught me many things about art, and I've got to study things when I see some of her, I study things. And as I read this passage, I thought about this picture. This is a picture that Rembrandt painted. It's called Jesus Calms the Storm, based off the passage I just, we just read. And on that boat, there's disciples and Jesus. And I guess because I like to drill down a little bit more, I looked at this picture, and I found that there's 14 people on that boat. And so thinking, I got, you got 12 disciples, Jesus. Who's the 13th per, or 14th person? I couldn't figure it out. I said, maybe it's the guy that owned the boat, but now the fishermen know how to sail boats. Who's that 14th person? And so I read and studied, and the 14th person on the boat is Rembrandt himself. In fact... He is right here, staring at you, staring at the people that are looking at his painting. And I read that and said, why would Rembrandt do that? Then I read some more and realized Rembrandt was telling his audience, then I'm one of those two. I'm one of those disciples that had little, little faith. I sometimes, in storms in my lives, in my life, what Rembrandt was telling us, I too have little faith. I have little trust that God will save me, will take me out of this pain, will take me out of this situation, will take me out of this danger or dilemma. And today I want to share with you a storm in my life. It's a storm that changed my life. I was a commander of an infantry task force in the 101st Airborne Division in Desert Storm. This is a Desert Storm map. On my shoulders was the responsibility and mission accomplishment of a 1,500 man task force. We were given a mission, and pardon me as I turn around, we were given a mission to air assault from here. I was in the 101st, and this is their patch. And we were going to air assault all the way up to Euphrates River Valley along a major highway that led out of Baghdad into Kuwait. Our mission was to air assault deep behind enemy lines. We would fly in helicopters. And when we would land we would block a major road that led from Baghdad into Kuwait. We would have to be prepared to fight surrounded. We would be separated from any friendly force by about 200 miles. In the first hours of the war, we would be almost 100 miles from the capital city of Baghdad. And if any of you can remember, all the fighting was down in Kuwait, some 400 miles away from where my unit was. When I got this mission, my assistant division commander told me that, Tom, this is going to be a difficult mission. 
and your expected casualty rate could hit 40%. If you do the math real quick, that's 600 soldiers, 600 dads, 600 sons, 600 husbands. I would also tell you when I got that mission, I immediately developed my plan and said, I'm going to get to work. I got to start rehearsing and practicing. And we did all the rehearsals and all the practices, and everything was going wrong. Nothing was going right. I had a highly trained unit, but on these rehearsals, it was like, it was like some, they just became stupid and ignorant. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't do what we had trained to do. And I couldn't figure it out. But since my ego at that time was probably bigger than this room, I said, all I need to do is drill down. All I need to do is focus and try harder. I can do it. I just need to, I just need to work harder. In reality, I was way over my head. But isn't that what the world tells us? The world tells us when we have issues and problems and dilemmas in our lives, we're not supposed to ask for help. Grown men and grown women don't ask for help. What do we do? We suck it up. We gut it out. We do it all by ourselves. You know, but in God's word, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will set your path straight. And it's clear to me now, in hindsight, that I just wasn't heeding those words. I was disobeying God's personal instructions to trust in him. I will also tell you that that during Christian, I did all the right things. Tied my income, went to church, went to Sunday school, did all those, you know, taught. I, I did all those right things. That somebody looking at me from afar might say, that's a, that's a real Christian man. But I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I had never asked him into my heart. Well, as, re as these rehearsals were going, and they were going south, I read, I, one night I read in the book of Joshua, the passage that you just read. And as I was reading it, I read about Joshua following the battle plan that God had given him to, to take down the city of Jericho. And Joshua followed that battle plan to a T. And in response to Joshua's obedience, God provided an earthquake that leveled the walls around Jericho, and Jericho was destroyed. And about the same time, I started, I had a pain in my chest, and I thought I was having a heart attack. But in reality, it was probably God getting a grip on me. And then I realized that my arrogance, my pride, my wanting to do it all by myself, not asking God for help, was not just going to cause 40% casualties. It could cause 100% of our, our soldiers being killed. So now with this pain in my chest and tears coming out of my eyes, I got down on my knees and I asked the Lord to forgive my sins. I asked the Lord to be the leader of my life. And I asked the Lord to be the leader of my unit. It still gives me chills, ladies and gentlemen, to remember how it felt like 10,000 pounds was lifted off my shoulders. The pain in my chest stopped. And I knew, I just knew that God was now the leader of my life and the leader of my unit. Afterwards, the next day, I went off for rehearsals. 
My officers and soldiers went from idiots to geniuses in 24 hours. Everything went well. And what was so strange that soldiers would come up to me and say, sir, are you okay? And I would say, yes. Why? Well, sir, you're acting different. You even look different. And I was. I now had Jesus in my heart. Let me tell you our battle plan, and some of you may think I'm crazy, but this was our battle plan. We were gonna fly from here all the way up to here in Euphrates River Valley with our Black Hawk helicopters. Black Hawk carries about 14 soldiers. Each one of my soldiers had 100 pounds on his back. I was prepared to fight for five days and I had no idea if I'd ever, we'd ever get resupplied as far deep as we were going into Iraq. Once my soldiers landed and the helicopters landed, they would get out and move into the position. I'd like you to think of our position along that road as something like the covered wagons of the West, a big, huge circle all around that road with that road cutting through the middle of that circle except that diameter was about five miles, and that's where my soldiers would be. Our, we also had, I also had vehicles and artillery pieces that I needed to take, so I had to take a heavier uh, helicopter, and we used what we call a Chinook helicopter. It carried vehicles inside, it carried soldiers, it also had vehicles sling-loaded underneath it. And they could travel, Chinooks, the plan was to travel from here up to here, but then if the Chinooks went any farther, they put themselves in jeopardy with fuel. There wasn't enough fuel in their tanks to come back. So what we decided is to drop all our vehicles off here, and then they would move by ground to link up with my infantry soldiers on the highway. And that was good, except for about three days before Desert Storm, the Euphrates River, right here, flooded. And that whole area we were in was knee deep to thigh deep mud. And there was also no roads for my vehicles to travel. Some of you are looking at me like I'm, I was crazy. The enemy situation was also complex. We had an, it was estimated that there was an Iraqi division located here and located over here. Those divisions were about 5,000 soldiers each. Those soldiers, those Iraqi soldiers had the best equipment oil money could buy. They also had this, these weapons called surface-to-air handheld missiles. They could shoot down our helicopters. All they had to do was be able to see us, and they could shoot us down. Our plan was, very simply, to leave at 0300, 3, 3 o'clock in the morning. There was absolutely no light. To stay below their radar, we had to fly right on the deck. Our hel helicopters were literally feet off the ground. We would be flying with night vision goggles, and we would be going 120 miles an hour, flying right between these two divisions that were here. Three o'clock in the morning, our D-days, our beginning, beginning operation. About 2.45, you could see the stars in the sky. There was no moon, no illumination. At three, about 2.45 to three o'clock, a fog came in, little rain, and pretty soon, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. There are still safety concerns, even in combat, and I knew we couldn't fly. Four o'clock came, five o'clock came, 
Six o'clock came, still fog, but now the sun is coming up. We're going to lose our edge because now the Iraqis, if we fly, they'll be able to see us. Seven, eight, eight forty-five, just like that, the fog lifted. And at nine o'clock, sixty Blackhawks and forty Chinooks took off. Each helicopter landed perfectly. My soldiers that were up here quickly moved into position and encountered enemy forces, and those enemy, those Iraqi soldiers were either killed or captured. My vehicle commanders landed here and reported back to me that he would probably be there in about an hour, hour and a half. And my first question to him was, did you land in the right place? Because with the mud and no roads, I knew it was going to take him maybe 12 to maybe 24 hours before he could link up with me with all the vehicles and the artillery pieces. I found out two things about this operation. One, when we were flying that storm, we were here until 8.45 in the morning. When we moved, when we were ready to launch, that storm moved forward and moved to our left and to our right, covering those Iraqi divisions. They could probably hear us, but they couldn't see us. And because they couldn't see us, they couldn't shoot us down. When my vehicle commander finally linked up with me up here on Highway 8, the main highway we were to block, I said, did you really land at the right place? He said, sir, we did. But there was sand, like a sandstorm blowing in front of us. On, and it was blowing sand on top of the mud. And sir, it looked like it was blowing a road in the exact same azimuth we were supposed to go. So not being a fool, I just lined up all my vehicles on what looked like a road, and we drove 60 miles an hour to link up with you. That entire first day and the second day, we fought violent fights, one right after another. At times, I was getting attacked from the north and south, east and the west simultaneously. We were to deny any Iraqis the ability to reinforce their brothers in Kuwait. We were also picking up units that were trying to run away from our, our soldiers that were attacking down in Kuwait. On day two, I got a call from, uh, we intercepted a message that the Iraqi Republican Guard Tank Brigade had been ordered to move up Highway 8 to a town called El Qadir, which we were centered on, and they were supposed to knock us off. This unit had 80 tanks and had 120 pieces of artillery. My soldiers had Kevlar helmets and Kevlar vests. That's all they had to protect themselves. We couldn't dig foxholes because the water was, the ground was saturated with water from the flood. And I didn't want to build any bunkers because if I did, I should have just put neon signs to say, shoot here and you'll kill an American. So we used folds of the ground and what you and I would know as irrigation ditches to hide behind. That unit never came after us. That unit never hit us on day three. And I couldn't figure out why until later I found out that about 200 miles to the south, a tank unit was maneuvering and engaged a Republican Guard tank brigade and destroyed 72 tanks in four minutes. When they captured all, when they captured all the prisoners, the prisoner that one of the prisoners was the regimental commander of that team. 
and he explained that he was coming up to El Qadir to knock off the Screaming Eagles, the nickname of our unit. But he was encountered a storm, a storm so thick that that Iraqi commander said, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. That's why we never got hit. Day four came and the war was over. The forces in Kuwait had destroyed the Iraqi army. The general sued for peace. When I got that call, I immediately called my staff and said, hot food, hot coffee, more ammunition, more water. I didn't know what my next mission was, but I was going to be prepared. I also told my company commanders to let my soldiers sleep, minimum security. Some of my young men hadn't slept in four days because of the combat. Then I got, a, I got called my company commanders and I said, I, we need to have a situation report. Enemy killed, enemy wounded, and then the part that I didn't want to hear Friendly killed, friendly wounded. We had killed or captured over a thousand Iraqis. We had destroyed close to 200 vehicles. Not one of my soldiers was killed. Not one of my soldiers was wounded. Not one of my soldiers even had a scratch. I will tell you, I did training for many, many years, and I would have soldiers break their legs, roll vehicles, shoot a weapon, and the cartridge would come down and burn the back of their neck. You know, when you have young men playing with things that can go boom, stuff happens. <laughs> but there's no way that anyone will ever convince me that God wasn't in complete and absolute control of my unit during that time. As I often end my messages, I end them with, so what? So what? Great story, Greco. What's it mean to me? Those disciples on that boat were being swamped. They felt overwhelmed. They had a storm in their life. And I believe there's people here today that have storms in their life far more dramatic than the story I shared with you. You might be dealing with a desert storm disguised as a bad report from your doctor. Or a grandson or a child who's going south, and I'm not talking going to Texas, but their behavior is bad. Your marriage might be struggling. Your 401k in this economy now might be a 101k. You might be dealing with an, a problem of alcohol or drugs, and you're totally dependent on one of those. You know what, what our society says, what Oprah will tell you, what Dr. Phil will tell you, what even my beloved Home Depot will tell you, <laughs> is that you can do it all by yourself. But God's word tells us to trust in him and lean not on your own understanding. But all your ways acknowledge him and he will set your path straight. I had to learn it the hard way. And it, that change in me in that tent and on that battlefield changed my entire life. And I want to offer you a chance to do that as well. 
Maybe you have a desert storm right now. You have a storm in your life you just don't know what to do with. And maybe you accepted Jesus, but you're like one of those disciples that had little faith, or Rembrandt that had no faith. Or maybe you'd be like me post-pre-desert storm. You called yourself a Christian, but you never asked Jesus into your heart. I'm going to give you that opportunity today. If you're struggling with a storm in your life, or if you haven't asked Jesus into your life, today's the day. Today's the time to make that decision. I'm going to ask Pastor Danny and Pastor Kevin to come up here and join me. And if you want to, just, I'm going to ask Steve to play some music, but if you want to, please come forward. I already checked with Kevin, and Kevin told me Presbyterians are allowed to come forward. (laughs) But I just asked you to come forward and pray with one of us. Ask Jesus into your heart. Ask Jesus to help you through this desert storm. Please come. We sing our responsive hymn.
friends, you may be seated. Come to the time of our offering, and Pastor Tom, my friend, I thank you for offering simply your human experience in relation to our Almighty God, for I know that many of us have been blessed by that. We come to the time of our offering. You have some deacon notes if you'd like to place in there. If you're a new visitor, you can place a new welcome card in the offering bag or quite simply your prayers. But friends, God has done so much. What shall we render unto the Lord? Will the ushers come forward to receive the offering? I do 
Friends, let us remain standing and affirm our faith together with the Church Universal as we share the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and as we do so, you are mindful that we have a number of Presbyterian ministers who worship with us, and I like to invite them to help at the table. So it is a privilege to invite my friend and my colleague, the Reverend Danny Forbes, to help administer the Lord's Supper today. Friends, we have the opportunity today to come to this table of grace, and what a gift it is. But the host of this table is one who knows what it is like to travel into a very dark place. Because it was on that night that he hosted this table. He did it with his friends. He did the invitation. He issued it to every single person there, even the one who was about to betray him. Reminding us at all times that we stand behind this table of love but we stand alongside someone who knows what it is like to travel into darkness, into battle, and into deep human experience. And so friends, as we come together to this table, we come with a joyful heart, knowing that we have been invited by the one who through his word has made the entire universe. For it was on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, to all of them, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, and in the same manner, he took the cup. And after having poured it out and giving thanks to God, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. A few items of housekeeping as uh, our serving elders and deacons come forward. Today we will receive communion by intinction. We'll form two lines coming down the center aisle. The two outer tables, you'll receive communion by intinction, where you will dip the bread into the juice and you'll return to your seats using these outer middle aisles. If you prefer a table that has gluten-free options, that you'll find that at the center table. And if you prefer being served by someone wearing a mask and gloves, you'll find that at the center table as well. If you're unable to come forward, our servers would be happy to come to you and serve you. Just let us know by the waving of your hand. If you would like additional prayer, we have members of our prayer team on the walls here. They would be happy to pray with you once more. And we like to allow our servants um, in the choir to come forward first so that they can be served and then continue serving us. Lots of announcements, but you won't get it wrong. <laughs> Jesus invites all those who hunger and thirst for his righteousness to come. Friends, the feast is prepared. Uh, and I'll invite Pastor Tom to come forward because he'll be serving at the center table too. Takes a while to put on gloves and a mask. Friends, the feast is prepared. Let us come to receive God's grace. <coughs>
Friends, I hope when you come together around your own tables, you pray. As we pray when we come around this table, praying for our family, a few things to be mindful of. We continue to be in prayer for the Jean Bond family, whose service was here yesterday, and whose memory these flowers are placed on the table. Next Monday, April 15th, Pearl Compton, her funeral service will be held in this space at 11 o'clock a.m. So continue to be in prayer for the Compton family. For Mike Boyd's sister, Judy, who's been diagnosed with stage four cancer, we've learned that the treatment is just making her feel too ill. So she has chosen to uh, discontinue treatment, uh, to live out her days with the best health that she can. So Mike and Karen, we pray for you as your family makes this journey. Uh, so many of you have been good to my family, the Starchers. Chrissy and I will travel to Salt Lake City this afternoon for a pre-operation appointment tomorrow morning. It's possible I'll cry. We're very grateful that Chrissy's sister, Linda, is here. Uh, she is one of the best human beings that I know. So, Linda, thank you for taking care of us and our family. For families all over who are encountering storms in their lives, we pray. And we continue to pray for peace in this world so that we don't have to send folks like Colonel Greco and so many veterans into harm's way, that this world would know peace. And friends, as Christians, we believe that there's only one way that this world will know peace. Am I right? So we have some work to do. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for your faithfulness. For the powerful story that we've heard from Pastor Tom, for the multiple stories that we know here of how you come to calm the storm. So Lord, for all the storms in this congregation, we pray your power to speak to the waves, to cease, that we would know peace. Lord, be with us to share this good news to the world that you have come in Jesus to show us the way. So help us to know that and to live that and to share that. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us stand as we sing our closing hymn. Your words are wonderful. As we head into our series on First and Second Peter, I would like to introduce a song that we'll be using as somewhat of a theme song for this season. You may not know it very well, but uh, listen and sing along, and there, there are sound recordings available if you would like to check the weekly email from last week. It goes like this.
friends, we have the good news of Jesus in our lives. Amen? So go forth to share this in a world that is hungry for these words of life. Pastor Tom, thank you. Pastor Danny, thank you. But the real ministers of this congregation are you, my friends. So go forth, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Thank you. 